Good morning. Well, if you're just joining us here at Trinity, we're in a series called Learning to Live Without. Let's face it, life is hard enough already without carrying around extra baggage and extra stuff to weigh us down. Things like worry and busyness, like Pastor Nathan talked about the first two Sundays. And today we're going to look at a universal problem that can upend your life, and that's anger. Wouldn't it be great if we could learn to live without anger? Now, before we get too far, let's talk about that a bit. Anger isn't all bad. There are some things uh, worth getting angry about, but the driver in the front seat, uh, the driver in front of you who's going too slow because they're only driving the speed limit, isn't one of them. Imagine if we played a video of all of us at our worst when driving. Uh, That'd be an entertaining Sunday morning, wouldn't it? You know, Jesus expressed emotion, even anger, when God's values were compromised, especially by God's people or those who profess to be of God. He spoke critically of the money changers in the temple, of the Pharisees and the religious leaders. He told Peter, get behind me, Satan. How would you like it if Jesus said that to you? You know, when Peter had different ideas about Jesus' mission. There is such a thing as righteous anger. Anger that responds to injustice. Mothers against drunk driving. One of my first experiences when I moved to Lidditz was I needed to find a new barber. And so I found one uh, just up here on on Broad Street. And on the counter, the barber had a picture of his daughter, a teenage daughter who had been killed by a drunk driver. And the barber, I learned, was a wonderful Christian man. And it was just hard for me to grasp sitting there listening to him tell his story, taking it all in, it just made me feel angry. Um, You know, it's right to be upset at injustice, child abuse, uh, rich taking advantage and exploiting the poor, fraud, deception, neglect. Injustice comes and it has many faces and you can look around the world or watch the news and you, you see it in all different ways. There are things that anger God and they damage the lives of so many people who are made in God's image. There's a place in Scripture in Matthew 18, 6, where Jesus says, if anyone does something that causes uh, one of these little ones, a child, to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's how serious God looks at sin, which destroys people's lives. The wrath of God because of sin had to be met with a penalty, and that's why Jesus died. The ultimate answer to injustice was nailed to the cross. When Jesus, a sinless man, the Christ, took upon himself the sins of the world. You know, there is such a thing as righteous anger. But let's start uh, closer to home. What makes you angry? Is it other drivers? Expired coupons? When you go and you get fast food and it comes fast, but it's cold. When someone interrupts you and then just moments later they do it again. Long lines at the grocery store. The eighth time you tell your kids to pick up their clothes off the floor and then you're walking down the hall and you look in their room again and the clothes are still there. Retailers that take advantage of you. Uh, In the screen above, here's an item. Here's a sale at Target. Except the sale price is more than the regular price. I saw this while I was Christmas shopping. I mean, I wanted to tell them, I'll take the regular price. You keep your sale price. That'll show them. How about when your um, favorite sports team loses a game? And that hasn't been much of a problem for all of you Eagles, Penn State, and Phillies fans lately. It's been all smiles. But when your team loses, that can make you angry. Or when the jerk at at work takes credit for something you did. And so we're just talking about all of these examples, and we're really only scratching the surface. There's a lot of things that stir up anger in us. Where does it come from? You know, it mainly comes from unmet expectations and fear. Think of all the expectations that you have, the expectations that you have for yourself, not to mention the expectations that you have for others. Guess what happens when you don't achieve what it is that you want? There rises in you growing frustration. Guess what happens when someone else fails to meet the expectations that you had or thought you had of them. 
it, it bothers you and you start to feel anger. Your kids don't remember it's your birthday. Your spouse uh, forgot it was your anniversary or they didn't say thank you for something that you did for them. Someone in the house didn't do the chore that you assigned them to do. The one item that when people went out that you wanted picked up the store at the store was forgotten. Your spouse won't agree to the color that you want, the, the beach trip that you've been talking about and trying to plan, or the new car that you're the one that's been doing all of the research for, and it's the perfect model. Uh, your lunch appointment isn't on time, and when they arrive, they say, oh, I'm sorry, I almost forgot. So now you're not just upset that they're late, you also feel unimportant to them. And here's the thing, the closer the person is to us, often the more expectations we usually have. Life is filled with unmet expectations, and you can't always control them. Sometimes untimely events happen, poorly chosen words, someone's mood, even our mood. It can lead to this volcanic reaction, and we just erupt like Mount St. Helens, and everyone's like, whoa, uh, what, what just happened there? What else causes anger? Unfairness, or, is, or at least perceiving that we've been treated unfairly. Someone else gets treated better than you did. Others are listened to and, and you're not being listened to. Just ask siblings, brothers and sisters deal with this all the time. They have all kinds of stories they could tell. Here's another one, disrespect. If for whatever reason you feel that you're not being heard, that you don't matter or don't count, it triggers this fight or flight response in you. Uh, in your amygdala, which is a, it's a small area uh, in your brain that deals with the emotions. It's all triggered and, and boom, just like that, faster than you know what hit. Anger is right there on your doorstep and forget the door, right? You're ready to bust some walls down. There's all of these triggers that just, ha just happen at a moment's notice going on inside of you. And again, it's unmet expectations, unfairness, disrespect, or you want something and you think about it all the time and you can't figure out how to get it. The road seems blocked. Well, the Bible has some things to say about this. James 4, verses 1 and 2 says, What causes quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the desires that, that battle within you? Bingo, right? That's where it comes from. You desire, but you do not have, and so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, and so you start quarrels and fights. It goes on to say, you do not have because you do not ask God. Why do you get angry? It often comes down to these simple reasons. Unmet expectations, unfairness, disrespect, or you simply want something and you don't know how to get it, or else it's some form of fear. If you're afraid that you might get hurt by someone else's reckless or careless behavior, like, like many of us, you start to feel angry about that. If you're afraid that someone might take your position, you know, like King Herod felt when uh, the baby Jesus was born, that fear sparks anger. And so we're, now we're getting into the nuts and bolts here. And there's two types of anger I want to talk about next. The first one is impulsive anger or visceral anger. Mike Tyson, a boxer, many of you heard of him. He once said, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the mouth, right? And then what happens? Everything just takes over. Uh, it's the kind of anger that hits you immediately. Like if a waiter comes up to you and, and goes to refill your water and, and messes up and accidentally spills it in your lap, there's hardly any lag time at all between what happened and your reaction, right? Or someone is driving, you come up and they cut you off at the light. You could have been hurt by their carelessness. Your family could have been hurt. All of a sudden, your emotions might become just as crazy as they're driving. And it happens so fast, our bodies just react. All of us can relearn to respond better to those impulsive, visceral moments when we're flooded with emotion. But it doesn't just happen overnight. It takes time. It takes being aware of it and, and more disciplined about it. The second kind of anger probably is one that is more common and yet more damaging to your soul than the other. And it's meditative anger. Meditative anger. It's, it's anger that just grows and builds in you over a period of time. And the more that we stew on it, the more that you think about it, the worse it becomes. The one good thing about it, though, is that we have more time to work on this one since it doesn't always happen quite as quickly. But the dangerous thing is, the more it grows, the more it defeats you, and the more bitterness can grow, 
and change your whole character. James Bryan Smith, in his, in his book, The Good and Beautiful Life, which has as a tagline, putting on the character Christ of Christ, because he wants you to live the good and beautiful life God has for you. He tells us that both impulsive and meditative anger are fueled by two ingredients. And again, he says, they are unmet expectations and fear. And when unmet expectations and fear are united, that's when uh, they ignite into this strong emotion. You know, learning to live without anger is possible. You might be sitting there thinking, no, it's not. It's not possible. But you can live without anger and without fear. You know what the most common uh, command in the Bible is, is do not be afraid. Um, don't be afraid. Be of good courage. You can learn to live without the overwhelming frustration of unmet expectations. It can happen in your life. It can be managed when we align our life to live in the kingdom of God. Well, what does, what does that mean? To align our life to live in the kingdom of God. It means exactly what our mission statement says on the wall behind me. When you align yourself with the kingdom, you're doing these three things. You follow Jesus. You love people. And you give hope. But to do this well, there's something very important you must do. And it's a non-negotiable when we're talking about anger. And you can't sidestep around it. There's just no way to do it. You need to reflect on and examine the narratives or the stories that you keep telling yourself that lead to anger. In other words, and you've heard this phrase before, you need to unhitch yourself from stinking thinking, which are the lies that the enemy keeps using to hold you hostage to anger. And so what you need to do is you need to dig deeper in your mind and you need to uncover what the motives are in your heart and figure out, you know, where's all this stuff? Where's all this coming from? Like, how did that happen? And you need to say, Lord, what in me is driving this? And so often the truth is, it comes back to some gut level form of insecurity that we have. Something's going on inside of us and then it just comes out. The narratives that we tell ourselves, they can get kind of crazy. I remember I was in the hospital, it was about 15 years ago for day surgery. And after it was over, after being transported out of the recovery room and into a regular room, they said, you know, um, we think that you're really going to need to stay overnight. And that didn't make me happy. It was supposed to be day surgery, and I could go home and heal and recover. And, and as I was laying in the bed, I looked down at three young ladies that were near the foot of the bed, and then again at this um, larger-than-anticipated incision in my abdomen. And my brain said, Ryan, I'll bet you were some kind of test. I'll bet those nurses or doctoral students or whatever they are, I'll bet you they performed my surgery instead of the doctor, just so that they can finish their education and get things checked off. And here I was, their guinea pig. I was so sure that something like that had to have happened because removing my gallbladder shouldn't have been that difficult, right? It should have been simple. So what, I, what did I do? I created this false narrative in my head. And then, of course, my version of the story, the story I was telling myself, started to make me a little angry. And it appears I was wrong, either that or I was on too many drugs or didn't come out of the anesthesia fast enough. Uh, I have a good friend who's going through a really hard time in life right now. And when I talk to him, he always has some narrative, some story about the bad stuff that's happening to him. And then he tells me about how he goes off on people. Like the other night, he went off on the bank teller at the bank who had trouble cashing his check because he thinks it's intentional. He thinks when these things happen, it's intentional in some way, like I thought when I was uh, in the hospital bed. And some of it might be, but most of it isn't. So he's allowing these false narratives, these false stories to control his life, and then anger is the response. And I'm not picking on him because I've, I've done it too. And it's probably also true that some of you sitting here can relate. You have to get a handle on the stories that you keep telling yourself. You know, when a person's late for lunch and they don't offer a good reason, you might start telling yourself, they don't care about me. They're not really my friend. We read into all sorts of things. You don't let someone, uh, you know, say you don't let someone borrow a tool um, from your garage and then six weeks later you're pulling out of the driveway and you go to wave to them and they don't see you so they don't wave back. And then you start to think about the story that they're mad at you because you didn't let them borrow the tool that they wanted to have. James Bryan Smith writes, often the negative stories or the narratives that we tell ourselves 
They have this unique process. They have this unique imperative quality to them. And imperative usually is expressed with words like must, always, never, you know, like sharp ways of viewing things. Here are some thoughts that cause anger and frustration in, in us when we start telling ourselves these, these stories. I always get the short end. You know, where does that leave you if you always get the short end? I'm alone and it's always going to be that way. Life must always be fair and just. Something's, something terrible will happen if I make a mistake and so you don't allow yourself to live that way. Things always work out for him, but never for me. I must be in control all the time or else, you know, who knows? False narratives are full of fear and what they do is they strive for control. And our problem is fear and somehow we think that control is the solution that'll solve our fear. And yet we're reminded often that we're not in control. You can't control your work environment. And I'm sure you're not thrilled with everything that happens here. You can't control the weather on days when you've planned some special event. Stocks don't rise or fall at your command. The economy doesn't change at your wishes. Family members don't march to the beat of your drum. You know, the need to control leads us inward. And what happens when we're trying to con control is we're really striving to change things with our own resources, with our own thoughts, instead of trusting God. And it becomes an occasion for sin, or what the Bible calls walking in the flesh, living according to our sinful nature. In Galatians, Paul uses the term walking in the flesh as opposed to being controlled or led by the Spirit of God. And so getting a handle on anger is hard when the Spirit of God is not in you and in control of your life. You're trying on your own resources, in your own way, to live out each day. But when the Spirit of God is living in you, it guides you in these ways. Paul says, live by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit, and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires to do is opposed to the Spirit. And what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. Listen to this phrase and then think about whether or not you believe it's true. Unrighteous anger rarely happens when we are led by the Spirit. Unrighteous anger rarely happens when, it is, when we are led by the Spirit. It happens when we give in to our sinful nature. It happens when we aren't getting what we want, when our expectations aren't met. You know, God knows this. He knows that every single one of us struggle with our sinful nature. But God also knows, and he has told us in his word, the kind of person that he has called us to be. He has in mind the kind of person that he wants you to be. And he wants you to be a person who reflects Jesus Christ, which is why he's given you the gift of his spirit. So how do we live according to the spirit in the kingdom of God? What does the Bible have to say about it? When the first book of the New Testament, the book of Matthew, very, very early in the book, Jesus is giving his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And early in his message, he digs into this point on anger. He says, you have heard it was said to people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Now, you and I would all agree with that, that the court needs to take a stand and take care of, of those people, people other than us, you know, who commit murder. And Jesus said, I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Well, that's, I mean, that's not fair, is it? To compare murder with, you know, us maybe getting a little bit angry? How's that fair? And next Jesus says, if you have a gift or you have an offering to bring before God, and then you remember or you realize that your brother or sister has something against you there, or there's some kind of strife going on, he says, go. Go and try to reconcile that with them, and then come back and offer your gift. Why does Jesus say things like this? Why is stuff like this in the Bible? Well, a couple of reasons. One is to emphasize just how far short we fall of God's design, and that's why we desperately need Jesus. You know, Jesus did a masterful job in his Sermon on the Mount of relating it to the, the Ten Commandments. And not saying, you know, live by all of these and you're going to be perfect and stuff like that. He takes them and he tells us the meaning of them so well so that he can show us 
just how far we are from falling, from being and living up to the standard that God had when he created us. So they clearly tell us that. But another thing, I think, is to just wake us up to this reality that the anger inside of you is not harmless. Jesus uses murder to tell us and teach us about anger. Anger leads us to a whole realm of emotions and actions that when they take over, you don't always know what direction they're going to go. When anger isn't righteous, it quickly becomes destructive. Words come out that can't ever be taken back. Actions and behaviors are done in, that are done in anger. They can't easily be fixed. They've happened. You know, God cares about us, and he cares so much about our relationship with each other, and he's trying to get our attention. He's trying so hard. What does the Bible say about anger? You can go back to the very beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis, and that's where God's teaching us about anger starts. The very first parents, Adam and Eve, they, the first two boys, they, they had two sons, and anger destroyed their family. Scripture says in Genesis chapter 4 that Abel had flocks, and Cain, he worked the soil. And in time, Cain brought some of his harvest to give to the Lord, and Abel also came, and he brought an offering. He brought the very best and the first of his flocks. And God looked, on favor, looked with favor on Abel's gift, but it wasn't so with Cain's. And the Bible says that Cain became not just angry. It says he became very, very angry. His face was downcast. And then in verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, so you see, Cain had God talking to him, telling him, hey, Cain, what's going on here? He said, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is there, Cain, and it's crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. And in the very next verse, Cain said to his brother, hey, Abel, let's go out to the field. And there Cain's anger got the best of him, and he killed his brother. I want you to reflect on God's words to Cain, because what God did was he called to attention uh, his anger. Don't you see what's happening, Cain? Your anger, your anger, sin, it's creeping up on you. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. You know, God wouldn't have said, Cain, get a handle on yourself. Get a handle. Get a grip. You must rule over it if it wasn't possible. God was speaking, but Cain wasn't listening. God's still speaking. Are we listening? You know, anger doesn't need to define you. You must rule over it. The authority of Jesus Christ and his power can destroy the power of anger in your life. Because of God, the sinful nature doesn't own you if you belong to him. Ask yourself this morning this question because the most important question you will ever answer in your entire life, have I made Jesus the Lord and the ruler of my heart? You can't rule over anger. You can't rule over it like God encouraged Cain to do if Jesus isn't the ruler of your heart. He's the one who can heal the anger inside of you. You don't need to feel like, ah, oh, I need to take control. You need to trust and pray that the God who created this world and the God who created this new day and blessed you with new mercies this morning will also guide and take care of you. And if you decide to go in a different direction, if you try to like say, you know, I don't need his help. I can do this in my own strength. You're just going to fall again and again and again, and that's what will repeat itself. And that's why God gives us his Holy Spirit, to help the weak ones. And that's us. We're the weak ones who struggle with our emotions and need to find our strength in him. The other day, I found this quote by Booker T. Washington. He said, I am determined to permit no man to narrow or degrade my soul by making me hate him. I am determined to permit no man to narrow or degrade my soul by making me hate him. In other words, I'm not going to let anger or hate steal my heart or take my energy from whom I'm called to be. Who are you called to be? God has a picture in mind of who he wants you to be. Who are you called to be? What's God say? 
God says, you're a treasured child of God in the kingdom of heaven. You are paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are ruled by the power of the sinless, eternal Son of God and by his Holy Spirit for a holy purpose. Not for an early, earthly purpose, but for a holy purpose. So let anger go. You are not worthless. You are worth more. And when others fail you, you need to remind yourself, they will. Because that's what happens because they are not the God who loves you. And the world isn't perfect place, and people aren't perfect either. God who loves you, he loves you perfectly, and he loves you powerfully. So let me give you three holy expectations that you can have. Three holy expectations to guide your week. The first one is this. Expect that there are many people out there who need a picture of Jesus' loving kindness and that you will be that person. Expect that there are many people who need to see who Jesus is and his loving kindness, and that you will be that person. Number two, expect that you will not be perfect. And since you're not perfect, number three, expect God's grace. Expect God's grace to pick you up when you fail. Expect that there are many people who need a picture of Jesus' kindness, and you'll be that person. Expect that you will not be perfect. And expect God's grace to pick you up when you fail. And then do it again the very next day. Because change is sometimes very slow. You know, we love in this world to be able to flick the switch, click the button, and instant things happen. But that's not the way it works with transformation. Just keep going. Consistency is trying to follow Jesus every single day, one day at a time. Now here's one more thing I want you to do to help you break the chains and break free from anger, is sit down with a pen, or maybe you wanna sit at your computer, and just write a letter to God to tell him how you feel. You know, maybe you don't wanna write in the form of a letter, maybe you just wanna journal some, but just write how you feel and don't leave anything out. Just tell him, um, you know, get out of your brain the, what, what, what the anger or the thoughts or feelings that just bounce around like a ping pong ball. Writing is about being honest about where you are right now, what you're feeling, what you're thinking. Writing to God is like holy venting, getting it out of you. Uh, God can handle it, believe me. You know, some of the Psalms, many of the Psalms are holy venting. Let me be clear, you're not writing down so that you can keep a record of wrong. So if that's why you're doing it, just put your journal away and don't do that. You're wholly venting and saying, God, take, take me as I am and change me and help me and do what you did for David who said, how long, God? Or God, how long will my enter enemies pursue me? Or where are you, God? What are you doing? You know, you're writing as an act of surrender and worship to God. Take, take me, take my feelings, my thoughts. And that leads to praise and greater trust in God. That's what happened for David and the psalmist as they're writing, as they move through the book of Psalms, you'll see at the very end, he's just talking about praise and worship to God after he's gotten it all out of his system and reminded himself that he can trust God. And so before I pray this morning, I want everyone to hear to know that you can have victory in your life over unrighteous anger. You can have victory and freedom in your life over worry and fear, feelings of worthlessness, and that change starts by looking at the cross and believing with all of your heart that Jesus has the power, the power to change your life and make you a new person. So uh, let me pray for you. And if you want to put your faith in Christ this morning and that's something you haven't done or you're feeling very strongly that's something that you need to do again and to live by his spirit, just tell Jesus, tell him, Jesus, look at me. Look at how I feel. I need you. I can't do this myself. Forgive me and just give me your spirit to help me. Help me to follow you. You can just do that right now. You can just pray, God, help me. I can't do this on my own. I need you so much. God, I pray that you would heal any damage that anger has caused in the lives of your people. That your spirit would rule our hearts and take the selfish roots of anger away, that you would bind them that you would uproot them. Help us to embrace the life of peace and freedom that you give us. 
Teach us how to manage our expectations so that we don't hold on to any that we have set that aren't of you. Help us to live according to your will. And just like Jesus prayed, not my own, but may your will take hold. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. One way to fight over.